This is DW News Africa. Coming up on the program, Wagner in the Central African Republic. Is it Moscow's model for Africa? Once a private military company, now it is Russia's long arm in CAR. And the Russian house in the capital, Bongi, is it just a cultural center? Its head, Dmitry City, says yes and rejects criticism that violence got worse, not better, after Wagner came. All this is just a mechanism to, uh, to make Russia back off from Africa, but uh, Russia is not back enough. I am Eddie Micah Jr. and you are welcome to the program. Wagner in the Central African Republic. Is it Moscow's model for Africa? The Wagner Group is a Russian military company with significant operations on the continent, a key tool of Russia's foreign policy. It was founded in 2014 by Russian businessman Evgeny Prigozhin. After his death, Wagner in Africa came under the direct control of Russia's Ministry of Defense and changed its name to the Africa Corps. It provides security and military support, but also stands accused of propagating anti-Western disinformation campaigns. The group's military activities have raised concerns about human rights abuses and destabilization in the region. Russia is also extending its soft power in the CAR and runs a cultural center called Russian House in Bongi. Reporter Zigoto Chai Achameni sent an exclusive interview with the head of the center. More from that later, but first, his report from Bongi. Ya Lublu Svayu Stranu. En français, j'aime mon pays. The 19 year old just passed his advanced level certificate in scientific studies. Like many students in this war-torn country, his parents were unable to pay for him to attend the University of Bangui. So, he decided to go his own way. As a child, I dreamed of being a polyglot, so it motivated me to learn Russian. Emmanuel is learning the language in this Russian cultural center, situated at the heart of the capital, Bangui. Dimitri City is the head of the Russian house. He says the demand for language classes and cultural activities shows it is doing one thing, bringing Russia and the Central African Republic closer together. Right now we are more focused on children place and uh, children enjoy it very much. We are presenting the Russian universities and Russian schools for local students that can go also for studies in Russia. And uh, right now, as uh, Russian policy towards Africa is uh, developing rapidly, uh, Russia is giving much more quotas for African students to study in, in Russia. Na ruska mizike, ruski, alpha, vivi. Naomi is one of the teachers in this Russian language center. Her father is a Central African and her mother a Russian. All of them live in Bangui, where she was born. She has a diploma in accounting and management from a college here in Bangui. She never went through a formal teacher training process, but her mother taught her Russian while she was growing up, and she decided to do the same to other Central Africans. The Russian language is an asset and also has very significant advantages for the Central African population in terms of vocabulary and language. Teaching Russian language in the Central African Republic is an added value. Some Russian critics say Moscow's aim to teach the Russian language here in the Central African Republic is to smudge French that was already a standard language here. Do you agree? This has no colonial or political connotations. The Central African Republic is a country like any other, so it welcomes the Russian language as well, and it is longed for by the population. Emmanuel is one of 500 students learning the language here. He is clear why, because he wants to move to Russia. I've chosen the Russian language to have the opportunity to apply for a scholarship to do my higher education in medical studies in Russia. Because at the moment, there's a serious health problem in my country. We don't have enough doctors. I'd like to help my country by studying in Russia to facilitate development. 
So you caught a glimpse of him in that report. Dimitri City, a key player in Wagner's African operations. Now, City has long been involved in Wagner Group activities in CAR, first translating, media and communications, and now at the Russian house in Bongi. In December 2022, City was seriously injured in a mail bomb attack. He later returned to Bongi and is a linchpin of Russia's operations in Africa. He also has a controlling interest in a mining company there. Wagner has been sanctioned by the EU and the US for human rights abuses, and City is also on that international sanctions list. For more on this, we've invited two experts on Wagner in Africa. From Dakar in Senegal, I'm joined by Beverly Ocheng with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Hello, Beverly. Also from Abuja in Nigeria, I'm joined by Philip Obaji, an award-winning independent journalist and a contributor to the Daily Beast News website. Hello, Philip. Hello, all of you. Welcome to the program. Stay with me as we go through this. Um, in the Central African Republic, Wagner has secured lucrative mining concessions, gaining access to valuable resources like gold and diamonds. Reporter Zigoto Chaya questioned him about that. Let's take a listen. President Putin says Russia doesn't have a colonial past and therefore is better equipped to work with African countries. But the Wagner Group, Africa Corps, is heavily involved in extracting minerals here in Mali and Sudan and elsewhere where you are active. What's the difference? Uh, back to semantics. Is every entity that is extracting resources a slaver? Or what? Or colonial power? <laughs> no, that's not the case. Uh, I think that this, once again, that's a tool of uh, Western propaganda to paint Russia as a bad guy. Uh, most of these allegations are unfounded and based on nothing uh, but, uh, but rumors and uh, uh, the application of uh, Western standards on Russian policy. Russian policy, as President Putin said, is to help. And uh, its uh, approach is free of this concept of uh, domination. Uh, because uh, it's true that Russia had never had a colonial past. Uh, and that's where our approach is different. We are acting as uh, a partners more than uh, the, the bosses that impose their will. So, and uh, we are there to give a choice to African countries. Uh, so we give them a choice to make, uh, to choose the partner they wish. We are just uh, a competition for the West and the West uh, is frustrated by this. But the competition is good, isn't it? Right. Beverly, let me come to you. You heard him. According to City, Russia is just competing on a level playing field. Is that right, in your opinion? I mean, the circumstances under which Russia was able to get into the Central African Republic allowed it to have some level of dominance. So they came in in 2017 when the CAR had requested the UN Security Council to support it with being able to access not just weapons, but also facilitate the training of its military to fight against rebels. At this point, it felt as if France, which had been the dominant power there, also former colonial power, and the UN had not quite done enough because the, the surge of rebel violence was threatening an elected government. Russia came in and was able to not just dominate the security sector, but also into the extractive sector, which despite there being clear mining codes, had not been very well managed by the, the authorities at the point. So in terms of level playing field, I think it depends on where the advantages are, what kind of message is being propagated and how it's able to continue retaining its foothold in the region. And that was quite robust in a way that I think Western powers had undermined when they were permitting at the UN Security Council the security deployment. And, you know, we even learned that the CAR became a sort of an experiment on what Russian diplomacy across the region would come to look like now, mm. seven years later. Right, right. And Philip, City says 
extraction is trade and Russia is helping the people of CAR. You've been to these mines. What did you see? Well, I know the city, city to be a very good communicator and um, very vast too in terms of knowledge about the Central African Republic. But my concern with the Russians and the way they have operated in the Central African Republic has been the fact that they have been acting with so much impunity and they want to take mines by all means. And that often means that, you know, um, firing bullets at people who live in mining communities and making sure that no one else but the Wagner Group gets to access these gold mines, including mines that are small scale, artisanal mines, so to speak. So uh, you can you know, mention some gains in terms of the Wagner Group being able to secure some kinds of places for the government, particularly Banki, the capital, which was you know, shaky before the Russians got involved in 2017. But when we talk about mining and mining communities, I don't think that there's been any play, level playing field whatsoever. Mm. Right. So, Dimitri City was a protege of Yevgeny Prigozhin, right? Who founded Wagner in 2014 to support pro Russian forces in Ukraine, later expanding to Syria and other parts of Africa. Uh, despite facing international sanctions, Prigozhin continued to be a key Wagner figure until his death in a plane crash in 2023. Stay with us, guys. Reporter Tsikoto Chaya asked City about Prigozhin's passing. Let's take a listen. A year ago, your former boss, Yevgeny Prigozhin, was killed in a plane crash shortly after the Wagner Group staged a rebellion in Russia. How did you feel when you heard about his death? Well, uh, I felt frustrated. It was a huge loss for me. Uh, not only for me, for for lots of people. Uh, so, uh, and it was a huge loss for, I think, for African policy in general and uh, for Central African Republic as well. Uh, Evgeny was a big friend of Central Africa. He made a lot for this country. Uh, and so, of course, it was frustrated. How close were you to Evgeny Prigozhin? Had you worked uh, for him before in the Central African Republic? Uh, I was an employee. Uh, when we started working with army groups directly, uh, that's when uh, I started working with, with him directly as well. Uh, he was uh, steering me in this uh, and advising me in this difficult affair and risky, risky affair. Uh, but uh, thanks to his advice, and good steering, uh, we succeeded with this project. It's likely that the plane was shut down on orders of the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. What do you make of those allegations? I make nothing. I have no information on this. So I'd rather not come to any conclusions as I don't have any information. Right. Beverly, you heard him. City clearly sees Prigozhin as a force for good in CAR. How did his death change Moscow's dealings with the country? So in one way, it meant that Russia would have greater control over some of the activities of the paramilitaries in the country, not so much in the CAR, but interestingly, across the Sahel, which is where they'd also deployed other similar forces. And for a long time, it felt as if there had been a bit of a tussle between the Russian Defense Ministry and the activities of the, the Wagner Group in the region. The fact that they seemed quite autonomous and that Prigozhin was presenting a political and military challenge, particularly to the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. And when that mutiny happened sometime in July, just before Prigozhin's death, that's when it became quite evident that Prigozhin's influence was not sitting too well with the Kremlin, it, it appeared. And so with Prigozhin out of the way, it enabled the Russian defense ministry as well as officials to have a bit more control over some of the activities of the paramilitaries. Philip, let me get your take on this. Um, 
Did Prigozhin's involvement in CAR improve things for the people of the country? You've already touched on the mining aspect of things. Clearly, nothing good has come out from there. But overall, you seem to suggest that security-wise, there was some sort of positive. Am I right? That's correct. Now, if you look at, if you travel to Bangui today and interview people on the streets, they tell you that they're living better now in more peace, so to speak, you know, than the year before the Russians came on board. And I can understand why they're saying so, because at the time the Russians got involved in the country in 2017, only the capital, Bangui, was under government control. And even at that, there were still parts of Bangui that you know we saw some rebels and militia groups somewhat have almost full control of. So they'll tell you now that they relatively have you know some level of, of peace. But in the rest of the country, you go to the northwestern part of the country, you go to the Andaha region the, in the northeast, people will tell you their experiences when it comes to mm. how the Russians have tried to forcefully take control of mining communities. So it's different kind of um, opinions. The mm. people who live in the main cities in, in Bangui and around Bangui will say something different from those who live in the hinterlands, especially where the mines, you know, do take right. place. So, yeah. Right, right. Now, um, several organizations say Russia is spreading disinformation in parts of Africa and CAR to distract from their control over local resources, probably linked to the mining you just talked about. Zikoto asked City if his job involved anything else and to respond to accusations that it was a front for something else. Let's hear him. Well, that's the problem of uh, Western propaganda. They take a tiny piece of uh, information, they extrapolate it and they paint people as they wish. This is based on some information from the internet. And actually, uh, uh, I right now I'm the ambassador of uh, Russian, like informal ambassador of uh, Russian policy in this country, and that's my responsibility. Uh, my main job is analytics and uh, cultural activities at this center. Uh, I should bring uh, Russia and the Central African Republic closer together by. Uh, cultural uh, uh, means via the center by language studies. But at the time, I uh, still uh, do my job uh, in the regions of this country uh, for President Todera as a mediator in the talks with uh, some uh, armed groups because I, I've got an experience uh, during my work uh, before Cartram Agreement or APRC Agreement. Uh, I still use it exper this experience till now. I'm still like... Uh, some time ago, I was in Congo talking with the anti Balaka to convince them to disarm. It was also, I think, it was a, a success, a successful mission that helped disarm a huge group of uh, anti Balaka in the city. And uh, the, like this, step by step, uh, I hope I'm helping this country, this country bring more peace to, uh, to its citizens. Philip, City points to his mediation work, says he hopes he is bringing peace to the citizens of CAR. What do you make of that? Well, they have tried. When I talk about them, I'm talking about City, Valery Zakharov, who was the national security advisor you know, for the time that the Russians became involved in the Central African Republic. They have met with various armed groups, not just in the Central African Republic, but also in Congo. And nothing, we haven't seen any positive results, you know, in all these talks that City has been talking about. And rather we've seen a situation where eventually uh, the Russian paramilitaries have somewhat partnered with some armed groups, you know, which they previously were trying to see how, you know, these armed groups, the various armed groups come together peacefully and then end the conflict. But when they were unable to get, you know, that kind of concession, when they were unable to get these armed groups to agree on a ceasefire or on peace, what they started to do was to, you know, partner with some of these groups just to be able to target the others. And a typical example is a group called Bagnati Azate, which is active in the central part of the country. Right. And now this group is seriously at war 
with um, some of these other um, groups. And then they have tried to speak with a faction of the Union for Peace Rebel Group, which is very active in the northwest of the country. So, mm. yeah, the yeah, negotiations for peace really hasn't gone down very well, hasn't been successful. Okay. And the fact that they are now siding with a faction, with some factions of these armed groups, I don't think is working very good for the country. Right. So it seems, uh, Beverly, that, you know, negotiations are not going as well as City would want people to think. He also said this, and I quote, that he is the informal ambassador of Russian policy to CAR and a presidential negotiator with the anti-Balaka in CAR and Congo. What does that tell us about his role? I think it just tells you just high, how high up the Russian influence is and the fact that this is not an official person working for the Kremlin, for instance, even though there's always been that intertwined link between the Wagner Group and the Kremlin. It's a person who is running, as we had said earlier, a cultural center, but is also able to have a very heavy level of political sway over who the government is negotiating with, what are the terms and conditions, how do you come to an agreement, which is a fairly powerful role. If you think about that's what a government's job is supposed to be. Mm. And it does say a lot about the level of influence that on the behest of not just the Wagner group, but even the Kremlin, he seems to have. And the concerns that some diplomats have pointed out about state capture or Russian influence or the fact that the CAR government has sort of become a bigger conduit to the Kremlin and the Wagner group. Right. So uh, Wagner has been accused of serious human rights abuses across Africa by human rights organizations and Western governments. In the Central African Republic, They've been accused of burning down villages and killing civilians to take control of mining areas. Let's get back to DW's interview with Dimitri City with Zigoto Chaya. Several organizations, including the United Nations and human rights organizations, uh, say violence here in the Central African Republic has got worse, uh, not better, after uh, Wagner coming. Why is that, do you think? Are you worried about that? Uh, all this is just a mechanism to uh, to make Russia back off from Africa, but uh, Russia is not back enough. Uh, Beverly, City sounds determined and dismissive. Uh, Wagner has obviously carved out a niche in CAR at the very top, as you also su suggested earlier. How secure is their position, though? I mean, as Philip pointed out, the Wagner Group has been fairly effective in securing particularly the capital and some small towns within the country. In 2020, they had this big campaign against militant and rebel groups that were threatening to Adara's second term bid. And the success of that operation is part of what gave them not just public resonance within the CAR, but also in the Sahel. But at the moment, there are various reports of some rebel groups that are encroaching within the capital. There have been some deep disagreements between groups that decided to side with the Wagner Group, either join their training and disarmament initiatives and their main groups. There's been skirmishes happening in the eastern part of the country where this one uh, militia group, the Pimbe, which has been involved in some skirmishes with South Sudanese um, military forces, has escalated because they are also partly being armed, apparently, by the Wagner Group. So it's right. a very mixed bag at the moment. Mixed bag at the moment. Philip, uh, just to be clear, this was a long interview. We've only been able to play brief excerpts of it. But uh, CT repeatedly stressed that, you know, he's doing the bidding of President Tuadera. Some analysts have likened this to, quote, state capture. Is that a valid accusation, you think? I think so. Look, I have been to the Central African Republic. I have gone to some of these... Um, areas in conflict. I have visited some of these mines, so I know what's going on there. And I've spoken to some rebels too. And what they are doing, that's what the government in collaboration with the Russians are doing in the country is, they are only doing what they want to do. They're not having any good negotiations. Negotiations means you talk to the various factions and then you agree on you know, who should do what and what should happen. But I think it's an issue of greed. They want to control the mines, as the Russians are mean. 
And because they want to control their minds, they believe that no one else should exist. And that's why this conflict is still continuing. And that's why it seems like the, after about six years in the Central African Republic, you know, it seems like there's been no improvement in terms of stability, in terms of peace. That's because no one is listening to anyone. The Russians are not listening to the rebels. They're not listening to the militia groups. They're not, you know, sitting down in a, a meaningful round table to discuss the problems and the issues, especially in the Northwest and Northeast. So right. that's why it all appears as if it's a step capture because they're only doing what they feel is right and they're listening right. to nobody. Right. So clearly a lot, a lot of the problems and issues persist and solution orientedness is what we should be aiming at or world leaders or the international community should be aiming at. Beverly Ocheng with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Dakar, an award-winning independent journalist and a contributor to the Daily Beast, Philip Obaji from Abuja in Nigeria. Thank you guys for sharing your time with us. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for watching. That's it for now. Be sure to check out our other stories on dw.com slash Africa or visit our social media platforms. I am Eddie Micah Jr.